Okay? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Marhaba. Assalamu alaikum. Session on world millennial, our millennial world. In uh, this uh, discussion, I feel a little bit out of place because we have a nice bunch of young people here, including Dr. Omar. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to bore you with any long introduction or any statistics. I just want to throw at you two numbers to keep in mind as we conduct this session. Number one, the MENA region, as you probably well know, is one of the youngest regions in the world. 60% of our population is under 25 years of age. So keep that number in mind. The other number is uh, our youth currently constitutes more than 50% of the total unemployment in the region. This is another basic and important figure that we need to keep uh, in mind. In this session, I'm going to try to keep it as informal as possible. We would like to focus on several key issues and answer some, of, some questions, including how can we make sure the coming generations are equipped with the tools they need in order to face the many challenges ahead? Also, what role does leadership and governance, uh, governance play? And the third question, what kind of legislative environment we should have in order to implement the reforms we are looking for. To address some of these issues, I have, uh, uh, I'm honored to have a nice group of people here with me. Uh, we have three amazing young uh, global shapers. Let me start with uh, Iman, Iman Akbar Rafia, uh, who is a researcher in public policy at the Diwan of the Royal Court in Oman and the founder of the Council or Omani Women Awareness Campaign, the Omani Women Awareness Campaign. Uh, she is also an advocate for education, employment, and social innovation for capacity building. I also have uh, Sharif, Sharif Hamidi. He's Moroccan, uh, an entrepreneur, a former investment banker, and a strategy consultant. His main areas of uh, expertise are corporate finance, economics, and strategy innovation. Lately, he's been focused on preparing the GCC countries for the fourth industrial revolution and its disruptive efforts on labor markets. We also have uh, Tariq al ulaymi Tariq is from Bahrain, who is the co-founder of uh, 3BL Associates in, in Bahrain, an initiative established to reimagine a more sustainable and regenerative Middle East. Tariq is also a climate change expert and uh, is among the first 100 people in the world to complete a specialization, listen to this, in the field of biomimicry. Wow. And I thought uh, international relations was an exciting major. <laughs> <laughs> we also have with us our uh, two uh, panelists, two prominent figures from the Arab world. We have Dr. Omar al-Razaz, currently the Minister of Education here in Jordan. Dr. Razaz, you many of you know, has an extensive experience working with government, international organizations, and the private sector. We also have Mr. Khalid Abdullah Janahi, who is chairman of Vision 3 in the United Arab Emirates and vice chair of the Arab Business Council at the World Economic Forum. We have a lot to cover today and we have a limited time, so I would like to uh, start. But before we uh, listen to our speakers, I would like to conduct a quick ad hoc non-scientific poll. Uh, I'm going to ask the audience as well as the panelists to, to s pinpoint, to single out one a reform topic that you think is the most uh, urgent to address. I'm gonna, I have a, f a list of four topics here. Uh, one, education and employment. Two, innovation and technology. Three, environment and natural resources. And four, governance, governance and leadership. So I'm gonna ask if, if you think number one, two, three, or four is the most important, most pressing issue that needs to be uh, dealt with. So how many of you think that education and employment is the most urgent topic to be addressed in our region. Can we sh see a, a show of hands? Oh, vast majority, can we? Okay. What about innovation and technology? <laughs> no, no, you already voted, so you can't do that. All right. Uh, environment and natural resources. Okay. <laughs> Finally, governance and leadership. Can you, vote? you can, yeah. So b basically, I, I didn't take account, but I think education and employment comes as number one. 
Do you agree? Yes. Governance and leadership, number two. Environment and natural resources, number three. And innovation and technology, number four. We, uh, our colleagues at the WEF conducted a similar poll uh, this morning, or yesterday actually, <coughs> and today, over the, uh, some of the social media platforms, and they came with, uh, with similar results. Uh, the most pressing, pressing issues they found was education and development, 73% of people said that. 19% said environmental change was the most pressing issue. And only 8% said technology, technology and Can't innovation and disruption. Can't blame it. All right, so these are some of the figures uh, I wanted to share with you. Now, let me go ahead and turn to our... Uh, uh, panelists, and I will start with uh, Iman. Go ahead, Iman. Thank you so much, Mohanad, for having me. And I would just like to start off with saying it's fantastic to see such young people as the majority on this panel. That is truly reflective of how and what the makeup of MENA region is. Um, we have the highest rate of, un of youth going mm. through transition into adulthood at this point in time. And 28% of our population is between the age of 15 and 29, which is phenomenal. And if you look at this in a competitive format and competitiveness and global economy, that's fantastic. We are your assets. And we are that resource that you can use and reuse and we become sharper and we don't deplete. But however, if you look at the context of our environment at this point in time, the reality is very different. And uh, I would like, I'm quite pleased, I have to say, with the polls that we both took mm. the week ago and the one you've just read, because education really is the foundation of every single in, um, industry and sector that is going to propel our countries forward. So I really don't need to be here. I, you all already have bought into the idea. So maybe I can start with sharing um, where almost the travesties of our region lie. And um, if you look at our unemployment rate, you spoke about that briefly, it is at 30.6%. I mean, figures are great, but to contextualize that, mm. that is twice as more as the global average. And that's, that's huge. And um, I can't tell you or say I can tangualize that um, or even under, begin to understand what 27 million people who are either unemployed, not in training, or not in education feel like every day. But what I can tell you as a um, person from the GCC and, uh, is that I can share with you a story of a girl called Medium. 19-year-old girl, finishing public school, coming out, hasn't worked, doesn't have a CV, you know, ambitious, she's done well. Maryam wants to, she wants to have the freedom to choose her future. Maryam wants to have security in her life and she wants to work. But where she sees this opportunity in the context of her culture and her environment is in public sector. Mm. So that's where she wants to work. Uh, Maryam goes to university, she goes to a local university because she had local uh, curriculum through K-12. Now, that's where she's competing. And when Maryam comes out not having real life skills and she waits three years for a job. When she's leaving university, she's coming into an economy that is welcoming her. This economy is not the economy when she left and graduated school. Fewer jobs in the public sector are available and they're getting less and less given the saturation of uh, employment we have there. She and her colleagues are waiting up to three years for a job. I cannot begin to understand the emotion, the search for purpose that she's going through and the emotional distress mm. in a crowded apartment with her parents and where she sees her future to be. Medium cannot be the norm in our society and we cannot allow that. She needs to be the exception. We need to work with her and her constituency to change that narrative on the predominator and move that needle mm. back to the green. I mean, I would just like to conclude with saying that when people look back at our, at our, at this time and they look back at us and they say, what is, you know, they look at our legacy, they're not going to look at the, how far we went in indexes. They won't look at what our competitiveness was in 2017 or how much we grew in GDP. What they will ask us is how smart we were in navigating together 
this colossal asset of human capital that we have. And we can't do it without an equal participation of public and private sector with the main constituency, which is the students, mm. to move that. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to navigate this discussion and really find areas that we could collaborate in. Thank you so much, uh, Iman. Definitely education is one of the issues that uh, have always been uh, at the center stage of our uh, uh, reform. However, I don't know what, what has been done to, 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 to change this system, to, to reform education. Everybody talks about uh, reforming education, but when it comes to real results, uh, we don't see much happening. Uh, I'll go now to Sharif, uh, who will uh, touch on uh, uh, innovation and uh, disruptive technologies. Thanks, Mohamed. Technology disruption, the fourth industrial revolution. Boy, if only I had a penny every time I came across these buzz phrases. Whether you believe that this is a brand new, distinct industrial revolution, or you feel that it's a mere prolongation of the previous one, I think we can all agree here that this phenomenon is all about exponential speed. The speed to acquire market share, to take up new business, is increasing exponent exponentially. To just a quick example right here. By the time I finish the sentence, a uh, classic retailer would have lost $1.2 million of revenue to an e-commerce platform. <coughs> the telephone took 75 long years to acquire 50 million users. The internet, four years. Facebook, 2.5 years. WhatsApp, 15 months, and Angry Birds, 15 days. Yes, you better believe it. By the same token, businesses are dying fast nowadays. Back 50 years ago, it took uh, the average lifespan of uh, the top 500 American businesses was 60 years. Now it's less than, than, than 18. Digital disruption means that we can no longer be complacent at all. We can either seize the opportunity and be game changers like Instagram, Netflix, or we can watch our businesses disappear like uh, Kodak or Blockbuster. But what does this mean for us? What does it mean for MENA? A large, diverse, eclectic region, like we mentioned, the region with one of the largest youth populations, a region that has been labeled as the most important part of the world of the 21st century. But it is also home to many young women facing unemployment rates as high as 40%. It is also home to 50% of its children, not meeting basic literacy and emergency proficiency standards. Let me share with you guys a little secret. Technology disruption does not wait for anybody. So MENA right now is at a crossroad. We can either embrace technology disruption and take advantage of it, or we can just disregard it and watch our socio-political economic situation deteriorate. Being originally from Morocco, I am uh, familiar with this uh, morose, gloomy, Prozac state of mind that many of my people and the youth of our nations um, dawdle in. And uh, at the end of the day, it just the situation is binary. We can either sit down and cry about the lack of resources, or we can collaborate together while leveraging our resourcefulness. We can spectate our way through life and devolve our DNA into an amorphous, hollow blob of uh, blandness. <laughs> or we can actually push through difficulties and empower one another to rise and thrive. After all, the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. Uh, my, uh, my grandpa, he once asked me this. He, uh, he asked me, uh, Sharif, can you count? Yeah. Like, that's not random at all, Grandpa, but sure, yes, I can count. Then the old man replied, good, because from now on, you can only count on yourself. Yeah. You should never depend on anybody but you. And Mina today can only depend and count on itself to rise to this technological disruptive phenomenon that we're living. 
Sure, you may say that we missed out on the third industrial revolution, but guess what? We still have a shot at this one. In fact, I call the fourth industrial revolution mean as industrial revolution. So I want you to stand with me. I'm just standing here, it's a metaphor, but you can stand up, stretch your legs a little bit, you know? Stand with me and say, I see my friends right here, you know, I paid them five bucks, so that's why they're standing. Stand with me and say that the fourth and the, no, 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 you don't have to repeat with me. I know. Tell us what you It's very contagious. So, no, but really, seriously, guys, say that our large youth population is not a liability, it is a gift. Yes. Sure, we may not have the most. Yes. Um, I agree too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. We may not have the most stable and most secure um, region, but isn't the illusion of security what killed ambition? Let us not forget, it is this ambition that allowed us to make this progress of, over the past 15 years, including a 10% increase in primary access, a 22% increase in adult literacy. Look, we're all here today representing, I'm gonna take my seat back. We're representing MENA's most privilege. But most importantly, we're also representing MENA's brightest, and let's say most impactful. So sure, inspire me. Inspire one another. Share your stories over your success stories on social media outlets. But most importantly, share your mistakes. Share the lessons learned so that effective models and solutions can be transferred and replicated. It is the only way for us to move from ambitious independent initiatives to a real visionary system systemic change. Da Vinci said this, I am impressed by the willingness or by the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must supply. Mm. Willing is not enough. We must do. So let me ask you this. Can you count? That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sharif. Very inspirational uh, intro indeed. Uh, let me move uh, to Tarek uh, before we hear from Dr. Omar and Mr. Khalid uh, their comments and their insights on what have been said. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Ahmed. And uh, to build on Iman, who is uh, a policymaker from the heart and uh, embodies enlightened consciousness and, uh, and lifelong learning to our heart. And also thank you, Sharif who's the pastor at the Church of the Fourth Industrial Revolution <laughs> as, uh, as well. I'll say amen to that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to add about 20 different more topics to the table, and I'm going to do that by zooming out a little, um, talking more on a systems level. So of all the regions in the world, I think the Middle East region is the one that needs to transform itself the fastest, um, but also one that needs to reimagine itself I would argue more profoundly than any civilization has needed to do at any point in human history. And I think that once we have cradled civilization, um, today the challenges we face actually confront our potential to prosper, not only in our generation, and I say that as a collective our generation, um, but also generations to come. I think the challenge that is in front of us is nothing less than evolving from a society which lives in a way that is not actually compatible with life itself. Um, to a society that is fit for the future and a society of purpose. Um, and just to give you some context, so yesterday we had an incredible conversation with fellow global shapers, and we spent the day talking about the challenges in the Middle East region, but also more, in more importantly, the solutions. And many of the challenges, of course, came to the table. There's a lot of synthesis over what was wrong. Um, and just to touch on the few, we spend billions of dollars on arms yet have the biggest security deficit. We live in one of the most water-stressed regions in the world, but also have the highest CO2 emissions per capita, um, threatening biodiversity and food security. We have rising obesity and diabetes rates in the Gulf region, but then somewhere else in the region, we have hunger and malnutrition. Um, we have the highest use of unemployment, and also among the poorest in gender parity, um, but also perhaps the greatest challenge we face, and something I think our young global leaders embody as well is moral leadership and courage and values uh, to lead and take us forward in the fourth industrial revolution. And what was incredible is that even against the backdrop of, I know, these immense challenges, the way that young people face these challenges is one of hope, 
a one thing that actually we still live in the most exponential abundant time Absolutely. that we've ever lived in, that it's still the most exciting time to be a young person in the region, that we can transform all of these challenges. But there's a but. But we can't do that alone. Now, I think there is no case where any single person, if you look at an issue like climate change, no single person, no particular gender, no specific family, or no specific generation <coughs> is capable of solving these problems in silo and alone. These types of problems that we talk about are deeply interconnected. So what I found interesting is that I would have liked everyone to put their hand up for every single one of the points you mentioned, because they're all part of the same. Sure. I can talk about the environment, and actually that is the core and the basis that gives us the resources to educate, to employ, and beyond. Um, and I think it's that interconnected approach that we're missing, not only in terms of industries, but also across um, across generations. <clears throat> so I also, and, I, and this is also an invitation, you know, the next time we also sit down in a circle like this, it's not that you're out of place or I'm out of place. Um, we're all part of that same place and it's, and it's that acknowledgement of us taking, uh, taking it forwards. And I think to, to also take that forward, you need a very different approach to our systems leadership. Um, Iman was mentioning the um, sort of global competitiveness. And I am a strong believer that in addition to global competitiveness, we also need to start measuring our institutions and our countries by global collaboration indexes. Mm. I think that it's not only we need to look at public-private partnerships, um, which are hugely important, but also public-planet partnerships. Um, us as human beings are not the only species on Earth. We need to be partnering with the over $100 trillion in ecosystem services that nature provides us, um, which is something that we can never match and employ. Um, also for our civil society, and I know we're very privileged in the room, um, but also there's a lot of uh, dissent and discontenting voices outside which need to be acknowledged. I think for civil society that feels that maybe they're living in more oppressive conditions, um, it's also an invitation not to only go towards nonviolent resistance, which has its place, of course, um, but also nonviolent resilience, mm. which is to take these frustrations that you have to say that I'm going to participate in the fourth industrial <laughs> revolution, that I'm going to be doing something about it, that I'm going to be creating the new models and innovations that are going to make the old system obsolete. Um, and also just to finish on the last note, um, it's important in all of our systems, um, one, to include our young people um, across every single level, um, but more importantly, to break away from the self-imposed silos. Um, self-imposed silos between generations, between industries, between ministries, um, sort of within, uh, within government as well. And I think looking at it also from a holistic perspective is, uh, is necessary to create the conditions that are conducive to life. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Tarek. You, you're absolutely right. All the points uh, that I mentioned before are of equal, not, not necessarily equal, but are very important. However, it's interesting to look at these figures and see why people think that the environmental issues are not yeah. as important in this part of the world, although they are in many parts of the world. 19% only thought that the environment yeah. was a pressing issue to deal with. So maybe you, you will touch on this some, at some uh, uh, later on. Uh, Dr. Razaz, go ahead. Thank you. It's actually hard to speak after three eloquent speakers who are at least uh, I wouldn't say 30 years <laughs> young, but I'm, one of the best things about being a Minister of Education is you're always invited to panels that have uh, people your, in, from your generation, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, the stories we have heard are both accurate about the reality and inspiring about the future. We need to break away from Maryam's story. We need to embrace the fourth uh, uh, industrial rev uh, revolution. We need to do all of these things that are co collaborative uh, that you are talking about. How do we do that mm -hmm. is the question. Somebody mentioned, we've been, you've, you said it, we've been talking about this for, uh, for the longest time. Three things I want to emphasize. Just taking stock in, in, of, of the reality, how do we change it, and then something practical uh, on, on the ground. There is a term for our youth that's been invented for us, and it's called the weighthood generation. Weighthood, like childhood, motherhood, weighthood, because we are, this is a generation of waiting. They finish high school, they go to higher education without necessarily wanting to or knowing what they're doing. In Jordan, 47% of 
uh, university students don't like their majors and have no role in choosing it. 47% of, so you can imagine. Then they graduate. Then they look for a job in the public sector and the public sector is not there anymore. Then uh, they, they, they can't start a life, they, give or, they can't get married, and, 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 and now the UN treats the youth generation in, in the Arab world as fr uh, from 18 years old to 29 years old, mm. where elsewhere in the world is to 24 years old. So we've lost already five years of our youth's uh, life because of this stalemate that we are in. So what do we do? We have to diagnose. It's partly economic disenfranchisement. Uh, disenfran it's partly economic. Our youth are not able to, to participate. But partly it's with what we are teaching. And partly it's a narrative that uh, is predominant. Fortunately, it's not uh, a monopoly over the narrative, but it's a narrative about the other, about the self, about uh, uh, it's a narrative of hate, unfortunately. It's not predominant, but it is there and we have to deal with it. Now, we have to ask ourselves today so that we take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. What do we want of education? Education so far in the Arab world has been to stress creating clones of our students. Youth who are identical to each other, who say the same thing when they're asked a question, who answer the same way, who think exactly the same way. And this is part of our paternalistic culture, but part of the third and the second and the first industrial revolution that wanted people who look alike because you had an assembly line and if you removed somebody from the assembly line you put somebody else who did exactly the same job. You, we, the, the fourth revolution does not uh, need that. It needs individuals, creative, critical thinking, can solve problems, can work with others, um, can think about how to improve something that they see in front of them. The first question is how can I do better than what I see? This is not what we are teaching. So, the first question, do we want to repeat the, do we want to create uh, clones of each, of, of each other? Or do we want in, to encourage individualism, individuality, uh, expression of, of, uh, of talents, of, of different ideas? We say, we always say uh, Arabs don't read. Why is it? We have to ask our questions. I don't think this is generic. Mm -hmm. People read when they have a question in mind. They search through literature for answers. In our part of the world, we have made most questions taboos. Either social taboos, political taboos, religious ta taboos, science taboos even. Mm -hmm. uh, so unless we uh, allow our, our, our youth to ask questions, without fear, so that they can reach uh, a, a, a sense of belief within them, and we're not going to. Now, how do, what do we do uh, in policy uh, terms? Today, somebody said education is a generational change, and it, indeed it is. It's not a push of a button. You're not going to switch things around in, in a year or two. Changing curricula, changing the way teachers teach, etc., takes a long time. However, I don't think that means we shouldn't act on things now that have uh, immediate short-term results. The reason I'm hopeful about short-term results is our youth are aware of their potential. They're, all they need is a little bit of space for them to start expressing them, uh, uh, themselves. So there are three things I want to mention. One of them is, the th and these are all sources of disruption. One of them is technological. The fact that now youth can learn on their own, if you put the right instruments and the right media and access to, so they can learn whether we say it or not, whether the teachers like it or not, they can learn. So technology and beaming technology to the classroom and to the home and to their smartphones is, is, is key and it's a game changer. The second is, outside the classroom uh, activities. 
all the stuff that we are not able to put inside the classroom because our textbooks are so full and the time in the classroom is so, and the relationship is so hierarchical. If you take students out to the field, volunteerism, uh, building things, um, uh, arts, scouts, uh, sports, you name it, we will inculcate a lot of the values and a lot of the skills that it will that will take another generation to put inside the, the classroom. Uh, the third one is how we exam, how we test. Our tests emphasize, whether it's the 12th year high school exam, they emphasize rote memorization. They emphasize the culture that we all have to compete along the same lines. And there is one number that will give us our value, our sense of who we are. There's a number that comes from the Tawjihi or from the high school exam uh, that we do. We need to disrupt that as well. When we disrupt that, teachers will start behaving differently. Students will take advantage of it. And, and we can start to see results on the ground, I think, very quickly, because I do agree with Sharif with Sharif that we can take advantage of the fourth industrial uh, uh, revolution because we are economies of scale and cheap labor are no longer uh, the, uh, the key ingredients. Uh, it's really trying to cater for very small needs and with a lot of creativity. That's going to be the key going forward. Thank you, Dr. Omar, for the informative uh, introduction. Excellent points. I wanted uh, to ask you, hopefully, if we have some time at the end. Uh, you mentioned education reform to make us more competitive, to make us uh, uh, compete better in this world. But there is also, uh, some people say, educational reform that is needed to combat uh, uh, con misconceptions, to combat violence, to combat terrorism, and to combat all these issues that are pulling our societies down and preventing us from being competitive and from being better people. Maybe you will, you, you will touch on this at, at a later stage. Uh, Mr. Khalid. First of all, thank you, Iman, for reminding because last night she told me that I'm going to be in this session without me knowing. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, because I was very surprised that I'm in a session with these young people and young person here. Ex-Minister uh, Dr. Omar, because of what he said, he's going to be an ex-minister. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I remember actually 13 years ago with right. Mohammed in the same place here, uh, when he had uh, all his hair was black and I had less boldness than I have today. Okay. Um, the discussion was the same thing. But luckily, actually, I remember I always, when I was young in my younger days, in a, any panel, I used to say. When the moderator said, okay, Mr. Janai, I said, well, I am the youngest in this room, so I'll be the last one to speak. And luckily today, I'm the eldest in this room, and I'm the last one to speak. So it looks like I'm keeping the, being the last person uh, thing going on. Uh, it's very inspiring listening to, to, the, to the young and listening to you, Dr. Ahmad. I mean, you, you use a couple of words. Some of my friends sitting around here, they know those words hit me very, very hard, and I'll come to it towards the end. But I think those questions that you raised about what reforms, most important reforms that we gotta look at. I think what Sharif said, what Iman said, and what you said, I think the environment is important, education is important, fourth industrial revolution is important. And I think all that is gonna come and we, the young, will take care of it and will handle it. However, the environment, I'm not talking about that type of environment, we need to create the right environment. Mm. You raised your hand, Mohanad, along with Omar. The, as the older people, with the point of leadership and governance. I think that is the criteria that for us, the elder generation, we need to create that environment for the young and the younger ones to come through. And that would be actually changing. I think you said critical thinking, the mindset shift from the so, social contract in the Arab world, from Morocco to the Gulf where we have the ruler and the subjects. In whatever shape it is, it's a kingdom, it's a sheikhdom, it is a republic, it is basically the ruler and the subjects. We have to accept and we have to move to create the environment for these young people to achieve their inspiration, to really come through, is to change it from ruler and subject to leader and citizen. Until such time, we all agree here in this room, you said we are 
the lucky guys to be here. I would not say we are the most intelligent people to be here. There are a lot of intelligent people, young and older people who are out, who are suffering because they believe in this issue of citizenship and they don't sit around. Mm. So let me just give you a story. Imagine someone in government, be it a minister, be it whatever he is, he's earning around $3,000 a month. No richness in the background, nothing there. He's not a new bourgeois, because all of us in the Arab world, if we have money, we are new bourgeois, okay? So he's not a new bourgeois. Or aspiring. Has, or aspiring. <laughs> and he does not have anything. Suddenly, from 3,000, he gets out of the government, and suddenly he has a bank account in Geneva of 150 to 200 million dollars. Suddenly he builds a palace for whatever, 15, 20 million dollars, okay? And he is not Zuckerberg, he is not Gates, he is not any of those who really created something. He was not a red true entrepreneur who created something and he sold it and he made money. And we know all where that money came from. And we still champion that person. That's what's happening. And I do see that around even in this meeting thing here at PWIF. We still champion people like that. And we know that the way things happened. Because that's the wealth of a nation, it's not the wealth of individuals. It's not the wealth of the ruler or anybody else to play around with it. So the citizenry becomes an important factor. Yeah. As, so, as long as we don't accept the citizenry the, to be the main thing for creating an environment, you do whatever you want to say. We can have all the beautiful industrial revolution, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, whatever is going to come in. But if we don't have this person looking at the mirror saying, I'm not because I'm kissing somebody, I'm getting this. I'm really getting it because I have the right to get it. I have worked hard. So we have this vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia. It's based on what? Equal opportunities. Okay? What Tanaf is Sharif. That's what it says. Reality is, that's a lot of baloney because look at the people around it. They have to accept it. So what I'm getting at is before, 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 before we ask people to reform, we as reformers, we have to reform ourselves. When we accept, as people at the top, embezzlement, okay? when we accept extortion, because I hate somebody, and personal, I allow it to happen, and then the people around, the cronies around that ruler or that leader, or whatever you want to call it, to keep people happy, because you want to go back to Abu Dhabi, I want to go back to Bahrain. Everybody I was saying, to, you, you, yeah, so you, you, you asked all Dr. Omar to be all concerned all about all his all job, all now I am. <laughs> all, all of us want to go back where we come from. But for the cronies, the issue is not the ruler, it's the cronies around them. Where if the ruler hates somebody and he wants to extort and be an embezzled person, but the cronies around it, intelligent people, educated people, who allow that to happen with all sorriness, that's bad. To come to it, education is the most important thing. But look at how much money we have spent since the 9-11. Mohanad, you've lived it. I've lived it. We actually, in the last time that I was Mohanad in this part of 14 years ago, 13 years ago, we were discuss discussing the Arab Competitiveness Report. It was the mm. first ever Arab Competitiveness Report. Who fills in that? Just imagine. You as young people, who fills in? It's the people who are already part of this thing here. The big boys. The big boys, it's to their interest to show that everything is rosy. Everybody gets the higher marks. Okay, suddenly the Gulf countries are the top. But when you really look deep down, it's all shallow. So I think it's very important that we recognize the problem rather than just go around the problem. It's what I always say. We want to go to the cloud nine, going from the sixth floor, rather than starting from the base. So we got to start from the base in order that you, young, as much as it was so inspirational to listen to you, Sharif, all that is not going to work if we don't allow and make the changes. So education is important, but it has to be the right education. Billions and billions and hundreds of billions have been spent, whether it's Saudi, whether it's here, wherever. We brought in Cisco, we brought in everybody in this part of the world to show the new type of education. But all that is nonsense. Because the real education is to allow critical thinking to go in the heads of the young people coming up and the teachers. Because before you have the young people, this is Absolutely. the word, it's the teacher you have to send. And that's why last night, Samer Khoury and myself, actually, we launched the Palestinian Education Trust, which specifically after one year of discussion, because the government has nothing to do with it, we as people, as the trustees, will make sure that goes through. And it's not a question of scholarship. I'm not sending people to universities. We are changing the mindset 
of the teachers and the students in the country to create the jobs. So as entrepreneurs, just to come back, as entrepreneurs, the most important thing for an entrepreneur in the real world is critical thinking. It's to ask any question and get away with it. There is no red lines. There is nothing there. You can ask any question which comes to your mind, including is God there or not? Even that simple question, you have the right to ask it, whatever the answer is. So the people have to be allowed to get that through mm. in order that they're going to be educated. Because as entrepreneur, whether you're going to get a job in the public sector, whether you're going to get a job in the private sector, or you will get a job by yourself. So always you're going to create a job for yourself as an entrepreneur. So creating the entrepreneurship mindset through critical thinking is the way of education. It's not reading, it's not changing curriculum. Marwan Master is a very close friend, but taking the Quran out of the thing doesn't, okay, might help or not, but the issue is outside that. It's not what you learn, it's how you learn and how you apply what you learn with an open mind. So I would say it is education, it is leadership, but we have no leadership. Mm. There is a book which is coming out soon, written by me, hopefully. <laughs> it says, the roadmap in the Arab world, basically the roadmap from rulership to leadership. Once we have leadership, we'll be in a good shape for you, the young, and the other people coming through it to go forward. That's going to be a very high price, but we have to pay that price as the elder person. Sorry. As the elder and the younger person here, we have to pay the price in order that the young can come through. Thank you, Khaled, for a very inspiring and uh, challenging no, he's, he's the inspirational person. introduction. Just as much. Do you have vacancies at V3, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, don't worry, we'll go together. All right, <laughs> All right we have uh, and probably... Heaven, and heaven can wait, by the way, so don't okay. worry about here. We have around 15 minutes left. Uh, I, I don't want to be asking the questions. I would like the, the, the panelists to be interacting with each other and take a few questions from the, the uh, audience. Let's start with the audience for, for, for a change. You have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Shaima Shawishi, uh, uh, I think we have a mic here. Thank you. I'm Shaima Shawishi, a uh, global shaper from Tunis Hub. So my question is really about education, actually. <laughs> so the, as, as Mr. Abdullah said, the discussion has been like 13 years now over the same problem. No, no. This, uh, it's been long, going much longer, yeah. but for, yeah. my, for my generation, 13 years. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, th what takes so long? Because we, the, the gap between the education and the employment, it's, it's a forever uh, issue. And we always having the same discussion. We always like having this same uh, meeting, but no concrete actions. So um, why, why it takes so long? Uh, when we see the other world, it's already taken the, the, the education into a whole new level, into mm. an online courses, into an open source uh, education. So, uh, and we still, uh, in our university's uh, path, we don't have even the, the soft skills education into our, into our um, courses. Mm. We do not have, like teachers are always um, teach with the, with the same methods and leave the room without any, even if I ask, I don't understand this, you, you, mm. <laughs> what, what, what's the problem here? Why, why, like? I think that's for you, Dr. Razad. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shall I answer? Go ahead, please. please. Um, that's a great question. And I think the answer is, well, let me sp sp split, split the answer into two. Globally, the whole world today, including the US and Finland, and are saying, what the hell do we do now with all the changes that are happening? So the, dis the disruption in the, uh, in the economy and technology is having an immediate effect on teaching everywhere. So everybody's asking that uh, question. And there is nothing wrong with asking that question and again and again and again, because the world is changing very fast. But we have been sleeping on the wheel for the last four decades, at least. Uh, that's my own memory, at least, uh, so, so maybe longer. The question we have not met, our generation has, has yet to answer, can we afford not to empower our youth? That's the question. If we can't answer that question, that we can't afford not to empower, uh, therefore we need to empower them economically, but also civically and politically. That's the way, if we recognize that, then 
everything else is easy. Otherwise, what we talk about when we say reform very often is we add a sentence here, we take a chapter there, we do, but we don't, we still have to get to a point where we trust our citizenry. And that's, that's, that's your point. If, if we trust, then we empower. If we empower, then we change the way we think, the questions uh, uh, we ask, and, and, and all of that. Um, we need to get to a point, and quickly, and maybe starting in, in education, of including the youth in the debate, including the teachers into the debate, and holding people like me accountable for, for change. This is, this is how we then put a process of governance into place that says we're going to achieve this in 2018, we will achieve that in 2019. The decision has to include, be very inclusive, and then accountability has to be put in place. Otherwise, we will continue to repeat ourselves. Can I follow up with that? Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have so much time. I'm really sorry. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, distinguished panel. Always good to see the shapers pitching in. Um, so my question is related to corruption. Now, um, <laughs> yes, the smiles. <laughs> um, okay. So since I might not be seeing many of you later um, <laughs> for a while, I just want to know, generally from a structural perspective, what can be done to reduce the economic impact of corruption and what can we do as young individuals to sort of, you know, elbow our way in and, and, you know, try to instill a new set of values in the way that the system operates? Excellent. I think Khaled is probably the best to answer this because Khaled has written on no, I just want to leadership make... through ethics. Yes. And when extortion becomes legal, that was the... You, you, you read these things. Of oh, course we read these things. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Right. Now, no, but just, if I didn't like him... Okay, I would have said actually his response to you at the beginning when he said this is a great answer, this is a great question. Any official says to you it's a great question, that's bad news. So he's yeah, not going to be the answer. So, but, but I like him a lot. He's going to be an ex-minister within two or three days. So it's going to be... Uh, no. <laughs> ah, you see? That's the reason, because you want him. You know, so he's going to be... Uh, now, I, th I think the red herring on this issue of corruption. I think we put too much into the corruption issue. I think before we talk about corruption, because corruption is a minimal thing when you really think about it. It is inefficient people that you put through. When you, want, you don't put the true qualified people in the, when I say rulers, by the way, I don't mean just the top. I mean rulers in every element. Rulers at the top, ministers, directors at home, your father, your mother, your teacher. These are all rulers at business. That is actually the system that we have in the Arab world, whether we like it or not. Yes, we have exceptions, but those are only exceptions. The reality is we are a bunch of rulers, okay, and we have subjects. Because we are subjected ourselves, so we subject everybody else. So I would say the inefficiency, and I was actually mentioned, and I think it's one of those, you'll see it there, when you put the wrong person in the right place, that's what creates a problem. You lose more economically, substantial amount of money by putting the wrong person in the right place than the corruption itself. Corruption is minimal in comparison to that. And the problem in the Arab world we have some, specifically actually, I would say in the Gulf. The Gulf we have much, much more of that where we have the wrong people in the right place. You're lucky in Jordan, you can put a lot of wrong people in the right place, but they change quickly because they get blamed for it and they go, they, they, they go out. So, <laughs> But, but I think we should not make too much of that. The extortion element is important because that's what I was talking about earlier on. And when you allow all these bunch of rulers, and there was the top ruler who basically tells this guy, I want this person dead, okay? And you do everything. So everything, basically what it means is that everybody is, there's somebody above the law. You can write all the rules, all the laws you have. We have some beautiful laws in most of the Arab countries today. It's the fourth industrial revolution in terms of the legality. So we have all the beautiful legal words and the systems there. Come to application, it doesn't work for some reason because there's always somebody above the law. When you have somebody above the law, you're already, that is the destruction. So for me, it's not the corruption. Corruption is basically something, a situation which happens because of the wrong person in the right place, because somebody's above the law, because somebody above the law wants Al al Mazaj, he wants whatever he wants. I don't like you, I like you, I want to give you, I want to take. As I said, when you champion somebody, Yuzhur Beredi, 
it is through corruption in an, in an indirect way, but you champion that person, you still showcase him, you still put him there. I'm sorry to say, we, and accepting this, we are wrong. We as people are wrong to accept that, I'm talking us as Arabs. So we always, I don't blame the ruler, I blame myself for accepting the situation we're in. So all this element that's a big talk, and I think it's something where the rulers, they love this talk about corruption because it's a way, shama. We've been used to shama at al qadiyya al Palestinian for such a long time to sway us from other things. And that's why we're not going forward. That's why the critical thinking where my friend, uh, Mr. Hikma is here, uh, Mazen, uh, we always have fun talking about critical thinking, but critical thinking is the real thing that we have to push and push forward. Okay, great. We, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. I would like them to be directed to the young people here. Uh, does anyone have a question for, for them? Go ahead. Hello, this is uh, Fadi Mikati from Tripoli Lebanon Hub. Uh, I want to ask you guys, the shapers, and uh, Iman, um, don't you think that the millennials are a little bit uh, overrated in terms of uh, how do you think that millennials are representing the youth of the Arab region? Uh, you, you, we have the, the many, many uh, influential people, influential youth living in a very uh, far neighborhood, but they are not called millennials. Maybe they cannot, we don't speak the same language. They, they, they live in a, uh, maybe urban areas or uh, marginalized areas, but we don't have like, a spotlight on them. Mm. So how, how much do you think are we representing the, these youth? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, if I understand your, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. If I understand your question correctly, you're asking, what are we doing as um, representative to represent people who are unrepresented? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. And I think um, I he critical thinking, you're mindset you're a shift. You're governmental official no, no, too, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I'm going to be out of a job now, too. too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hiring, let us know. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is that when you talk about critical thinking and you talk about shifting the mindset, that is, you've hit the nail on the head. And when you talk about teachers, that's also the nail on the head. Um, when I talk about education, I'm not talking about education for the privileged. I'm not talking about private schools. I'm talking about reforming education for the public schools, for the people that are in the villages, for the people that don't have access to what we have, as Sharif said, you know, we represent the privileged. So when I use the exp experience of Medium and when I speak about mentality, Medium if she probably had critical thinking and she had the teachers that you know used different pedagogy and talked about career development, she may have ima reimagined her life in a completely different way. But unless we really institutionalize that in the education system and reform that critical thinking and that space to reflect and experience um, something different to the generation we were raised with, we won't change the rhetoric. So just to answer your question in short, I think um, the way I personally do it is through reform. My areas of expertise and passion are on employment, education, and capacity building. And everything I do from my profession to my personal life is very much, you know, invested in that. And I think as a community, we do a lot of projects at grassroots in the Global Shapers. And all of that is around really bringing young people and their great work onto the forefront. Okay, we'll take one more for the young uh, Shapers. Hello, I'm Philip Abu Zaid from uh, Beirut Hub. Um, congratulations for what you have done. The, the question here is, all the initiatives come from the private sector, from private people who are taking the initiative. How can we create a platform on a governmental level in all the Arab countries that helps people who have ideas to create these ideas and to come to the light? Because we know there are many. So this is the first question. And second, about Maryam that you are talking about. We are talking about innovation, but Maryam is still going probably to school with the 10 kilograms of uh, bag uh, for, with books. So where is the change that we need? We need practical change on the ground. We are talking here great ideas, but governments are, not, are doing nothing. So how can we do this? Okay. Thank you. Sh Sharif or, or yeah. Tariq would like to tackle this. I can maybe jump in first. Um, first. Thank you for the question. I also couldn't agree with you more of changing the dynamics 
of um, of sort of ruler and uh, and follower. Um, I would also say that someone like Maryam um, ideally would be from ruler to leader, but then that leader is also a leader alongside Maryam. Um, that's the vision I hope to see. Um, I think when it comes to, and you also talked about corruption, um, when you look at things like, again, I'm from the climate change world, I can see the corruption that's happened also relating to resources um, very clearly when it comes to UN negotiations, etc. But what I'm also seeing with the fourth industrial revolution is the transformation of something like where uh, rulership used to be based on also access to power, to fuel, um, and now fuel is becoming a technology. It's solar. Um, Maryam will soon not have the, a lot of uh, things on her back because um, a lot of that will be digital, that will be online, also what uh, I think what Sharif was, uh, um, what was sharing. And I think as young people, it's also using these tools at our disposal. We are the most powerful generation that's ever existed in human history. Um, and I think all the shapers are embodiments of that. And I think it's also our responsibility to go back and provide it to these most marginalized communities who may not have access um, as we do and give them that same power. Okay, Sharif, in, th in 30 seconds, please, because we need to wrap up. Very quickly, sure. Uh, I think you're all the way in the back, but I'm going to look at you in the screen over there. Uh, again, it's going back to that point that I said. It's moving from ambitious independent initiatives to actual uh, systemic change reforms. Um, I've been here talking to a lot of global shapers. I've met the top 100 startups, and I see a lot of them uh, strong, powerful initiatives. So I think really it's not so much, we should not wait for any government. We can have, like, just like how we had so many ideas from startups and artificial intelligence and whatnot, we can have somebody like, who comes up with a product that connects the youth. Actually, we don't even need the product. Just like I said, instead of, you know, say, you know, brag about your successes, you're entitled to that, but also share the mistakes that are learned. To go back to that example, that little girl, trust me, it's not even the 10 kilo backpack that's bothering her, it's probably, access to school. School is so far away from her. And just to throw in a little example here that I'm working on with some government, uh, government entities and previous shapers. In Morocco, what we're doing, we're recycling your old phones. You got the iPhone 7? Congratulations. Give me your previous iPhone. And with that, we put in a system of exploitation full of apps and education, and then we give it to this young girl. And see the impact as simple as that. I get my, the lessons learned from this little venture right here, and then I, I give it back to you in Egypt, in Tunisia, and then you try it your own way. And that's how we build that network. And that's how we move from initiatives to reform. Okay, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to borrow four minutes from Duaf. Uh, I want to ask each one of you to, in one minute, summarize what's one single issue that you can take away with you from this session. Hmm. All right. Um, the change we are talking about requires a broad coalition. This is not something that can be parachuted by in, in, any, in any sense. Change is difficult, is scary, but the way to do it, and the way we have been doing it in Jordan, is to give voice, and there was a question about how do we give voice to young people, be accountable to that voice, and build the support necessary at all levels. There are NGOs and civic uh, organizations that are doing amazing things in Jordan, really incredible things. The challenge for us is how do we scale it when we see a success mm -hmm. story? How do you scale it up? At the level of government, at the level of top leadership, His Majesty just wrote a paper two weeks ago about the importance of that sort of change in the sector of education so that the, it is not seen as some, something that is outside the realm, of out, outside officialdom. So you need that at the leadership level, and it's happening at the government level to open up. It, we, sh we can't act in the Ministry of, of uh, Education as a bastion mm. with closed doors and windows. We need to open up and become the core through which all these initiatives come in, and we try things out, and we build and succeed. Uh, uh, and, and, and scale up. Okay. So it's mostly about governance and inclusion and voice of everybody. Khaled, one, one single takeaway. Change is going to happen. Either we ride it or it's going to walk over us. And I hope we're going to ride it rather than walk over us. That's what I like. Sharif. I think it was very obvious. I, we can't like, hide the big elephant. And I wrote it right here. More agile and transparent governance models. 
Iman? Um, I guess the key things that I'm um, taking away from this discussion is that um, grace is something that we can learn from and change. Um, and it's something that we need to be able to compete in the Arab world, whether we're in Morocco or Mauritius, um, completely the same platform. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we need second. to be able to compete on a platform, on the same platform whether if we're from Mauritius or from Morocco. Um, we need to be able to invest in teachers so they can start facilitating and not telling us what we need to learn. We need to start investing in career development. And most of all, I feel like the change that some of my colleagues here have spoken about and the impact that they're really seeking on the ground will need to come from a collaboration of the private and public sector because that model will need to change as we move forward. Got it. Change is going to happen. It's also going to happen because of the decisions we're taking today um, by leaders who are already in place, um, by rulers who are already in place. I think it's a challenge for us as young people to educate also our elders, um, to make them understand our perspectives. Um, I'm a big believer in lifelong learning. I think also from these um, conversations, I also invite someone like Mr. Janahi, um, also as a fellow Bahraini, um, to, to also work together with Bahraini youth and I think we could use that type of wisdom and leadership um, as one in some of the grassroots communities, um, but also speaking, of course, truth to power um, and being able to have these honest and open conversations, um, also ones that are based on trust, but one that's also more on leader to leader, um, one that's based on mutual education. Well, thank you all so much. I think this was a very interesting discussion. We needed another hour at least to cover the, everything, but uh, thank you all. Dr. Razad, thank you for being with us. Mr. Khaled Jinahi, Sharif, Iman, and Tari. Thank you all for coming.